This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media, March 5th, 2021. I'm Claire Healy, and as we kick off March, these are the stories from Amherst, Massachusetts for this past week. Beginning on Monday, March 1st, Massachusetts re-entered Phase 3, Step 2, of its reopening for the first time since last fall. This was due to lower daily coronavirus case numbers and increased vaccinations as we quickly approach one full year into the pandemic. The new easing of restrictions includes in allowing indoor performance spaces, such as theaters and concert halls, to reopen at up to 50% capacity or a 500 person maximum. In general, capacity limits will increase for businesses in all sectors to 50%, not including employees. The Baker Polito administration still reiterated the importance of mask wearing and limited contact with others, as well as restrictions for out-of-state travel. Restaurants will no longer face percentage capacity limits, but are still required to abide by a six-foot minimum separation between tables, as well as a six-person per table limit and 90-minute seating limit. However, cities and towns still have the discretion to enforce their own restrictions that go further than what the state is outlining. If COVID-19 numbers remain low, the state will move into phase four, step one of its reopening beginning March 22nd. Looking to enjoy the outdoors while staying close to home, Amherst Weekly Report's field correspondent, Rebecca Duffy, highlighted three outdoors places you can explore this spring. Thanks, Claire. March is finally here, which means we are one month closer to the end of winter, and I'm so excited about that. The temperature is finally rising, and a lot of Amherst residents have taken to outdoor activities. If you're looking to do the same, here are some fun outdoor activities you can do in the Amherst area. If you're looking to go biking, rollerblading, or simply enjoy a long walk, check out the Norwatuck Rail Trail. This 11-mile-long paved trail connects Northampton, Hadley, and Amherst together. The trail features multiple bridges that cross over the Connecticut River, and it also passes through Connecticut River Greenway State Park. Free parking is available as well. Our next stop is Maple Valley Creamery, which is located at 102 Mill Valley Road in Hadley. Their on-site farm store sells Maple Valley ice cream, raw milk cheddar, and cheese curds made from their brown Swiss cow's milk. You can say hi to their cows while they bask in the sunlight this time of the year. Don't feel like getting out of your car? You can see them from the road. Our last stop is in Amherst. Located at 4 Boltwood Drive in North Amherst is Puffer's Pond, the largest open body of water in Amherst. According to the Amherst Town website, Puffer's Pond is 11 acres in size, with an average depth of 5 feet and a maximum depth of more than 20 feet. During warm months, it is a prominent area for activities like fishing, canoeing, and swimming. Until the pond starts to unfreeze and the weather becomes warm enough for swimming, you can take a stroll around it and enjoy the Amherst scenery. No matter where you go this spring, remember to mask up and socially distance. Reporting for the Amherst Weekly Report, I'm Rebecca Duffy. Northampton and Amherst are collaborating to provide 5,000 vaccinations per week to eligible Massachusetts residents. The Amherst vaccination site is at the Bangs Community Center and the Northampton site is at the Northampton Senior Center. The sites became operational on March 1st. Appointments are available for individuals who qualify under Phase 1 guidelines. People in Phase 2, Groups 1 and 2, are also eligible at this time. The Amherst Town Council held a public forum regarding the Jones Library options on Wednesday, March 3rd. The Jones Library is planning a $36.3 million expansion and renovation. The Town of Amherst would pay $15.8 million, according to the Daily Hampshire Gazette. A second public forum will be held on Saturday, March 6th at 2 p.m. A link to the meeting is available on the town's website. 
Following Black History Month, we dug into the story of Angeline Palmer's heroic escape from a plot to sell her into slavery in Amherst in 1840. Angeline Palmer was a young orphan black girl who became a ward of the town of Amherst after the death of her mother. The town hired her out as a servant for a white couple in Belchertown, Mason and Susanna Shaw, who plotted to sell her into slavery in Georgia for $600 when Palmer was 10 years old. Servants overheard the plot and raised the alarm among the wider African American community in Amherst, including Palmer's half-brother, Louis Frazier, and two of his friends, Henry Jackson and William Jennings. The three men appealed to the town of Amherst selectmen to take action, as Palmer was under the town's protection, but the selectmen refused. Ultimately, in a heroic rescue, Fraser, Jackson, and Jennings pushed themselves into the Shaw's house and took Palmer to the house of a nearby abolitionist, Spencer Church. She was then secretly moved to Coleraine, Massachusetts, to live with a black resident there named Charles Green. The three men all faced jail time for their action and refused an offer to acquit them if they divulged Palmer's location. They were free on bail until their trial and then spent three months in the county jail. Their lawyer was Emily Dickinson's father, Edward Dickinson. We spoke with Cliff McCarthy, archivist at Springfield Museums and a volunteer archivist at the Stonehouse Museum in Belchertown who has followed, researched, and written about the Angeline Palmer story. He described extensive efforts throughout Amherst to uncover this story and the various details within it. He noted that her rescuers were widely hailed as heroes, and a lot of news sources, including the Daily Hampshire Gazette, criticized the town for not taking action to protect her. I first came across the story in a publication by Dan Lombardo, um, called The Hedge Away, um, published there in Amherst. Um, Dan used to write for a, a local newspaper, and um, it's a collection of his stories in the newspaper. And that was the first time I had come across that story, and it mentioned the Shaws in Belchertown, which was of interest to us. And so we started looking at it from the Belchertown perspective. Dan was looking at it, you know, as a, a writer from Amherst. So we were looking at it from the Belchertown perspective. What could we contribute to the story um, about the, the, the Shaws and their role in Belchertown? Since then, it's, it's been picked up. Um, it was in James Avery Smith's book on the Black families in, in Amherst. Um, Robert Romer has done a lot of research and work on the um, researching the Black families in Amherst. And um, he and I worked a little bit on um, researching some of the Angeline Palmer story too. In the 1840s, when this story occurred, black people were still commodities, even here in New England. You know, we think of ourselves as being the, the pinnacle of abolitionism, but um, there were still people that would be willing to sell another person um, into slavery. And it is really heroic if you look at it from the perspective of the, the really upstanding um, individuals that rescued Angeline from, the, from her fate and were not willing to disclose her location in spite of the fact that they were threatened with, with jail time. And, um, and, you know, so we've done what we can. I've, I've really, um, I wrote about it in the, the newspaper and, and in our collection of um, historical stories that we published here. Um, Doris Dickinson also pursued it. And it was a, you know, we, it was part of our walking tour. The house where the event occurred still stands. Um, maybe we should get a historic marker or something for it. I don't know. But um, but we've tried to bring it to light, and, and more and more, I think people are um, resurrecting um, what was a lost story because of the the value that it has for us now in understanding the times. While he said he did not know of a story directly parallel to Angeline Palmer's in the Amherst area. He pointed to recent efforts to draw attention to kidnappings at the time of African-American people throughout the North in an attempt to sell them into slavery in the South. I don't know of any other analogous situation where a bound out person was um, 
sold into slavery or attempted to seal to be sold into slavery. However, in the last couple of years, um, maybe five years or so, there's been much more attention to the story of free African Americans that were sold into slavery, kidnapped and sold into slavery. Um, there is a new book uh, came out last year called the, the Kidnapping Club about um, uh, the confluence of different um, uh, powers that um, set up children, particularly African-American children in New York City to be kidnapped and sold into slavery. Um, there's a lot more attention being being spent and we're discovering that it's actually a story that is much more widely that, that happened much more frequently than we had previously um, understood. While her later life is lesser known, Angeline Palmer did come back to Amherst, marry and have a son. But we do know that she came back to Amherst and she married um, a gentleman named Sanford Jackson. And, um, and she had a child with Sanford. Um, and that child, she may have died in childbirth, but there is no record of her death that we can, that we can find. She certainly died shortly thereafter, and the child was placed with another family, um, a rel distant relative in Amherst, and then in a few years winds up in the, the last record that we have for him is as a child in the Brimfield um, almshouse. And that's the last record that we can find of him. So I, uh, sadly, uh, the story has sort of um, uh, a, a less than satisfactory ending, I guess. Um, she, as I said, she made her way back to Amherst, but I think she just tried to live under the radar and, um, and sadly died before um, she could really fully live her life. The town of Amherst recently appointed Sue Adet to serve as permanent town clerk having worked in the town clerk's office since 2005. Audette has previously served as both assistant town clerk and acting town clerk throughout the tenure of four other previous permanent town clerks. She was most recently acting town clerk this past fall, following the September leave of absence and December resignation of former town clerk Shavina Martin. Amherst Media spoke with Audette to learn more about her prior experience as well as her current goals and ambitions for the town clerk's office. Well, um, having gone through 15 years of everything in this office, you know, and everything's cyclical, so that's 15 cycles of everything, you know, census, dog licensing, all the daily um, business certificates, marriage intentions, um, recording vital records, all kinds of things. After a while, it just becomes second nature. You know everything. I have good reference materials I can put my finger on. I know where everything is. Um, <laughs> my coworker is like, have you ever? And I'm like, oh, yeah. You know, and, oh, and where is this? Oh, it's right there. You know, just <laughs> this is like my home, you know. Audette has been involved in 44 elections through her time in the town clerk's office, including overseeing the November 2020 elections with increased mail-in voting. She has several initiatives she would like to see continued and progressed related to voting in Amherst. These include the possible implementation of ranked choice voting and greater engagement with the local community in the voting process. But the biggest thing, if that does pass quickly, is going to be rolling out a huge education program, um, trying to get word out in various ways on what it means, you know, what is a ranked choice ballot, how does it work, all of that. So that's going to be a huge thing. Um, it will be happening at some point. It may not be this year again, but if it is not this year, then I'd like to start implementing things early next year just to get it out, you know, continuously so it's in the public eye and not just beforehand, whatever election we're talking. Um, so there's that. And I also want to, with this past election and all of the you know, the mail-in ballots and the fact that we had a central tabulation facility to tabulate those mail-in ballots as opposed to sending them all to the precincts. Um, we got a lot of um, people that normally never have worked the elections because we needed the staff from the colleges, from everywhere. And I want to maintain that. I want to continue it as best we can, um, depending on, you know, the need. But I'd like to engage more students, um, 
reach out to the populations that normally wouldn't be involved and get them involved. Other initiatives Audet has overseen and would like to continue to improve upon include updating and streamlining the dog licensing program, which has moved online due to the pandemic, the restoration of vital records such as births, marriages, and deaths, and passing the institutional knowledge of the town clerk's office onto the rest of its staff. This office, the importance of being in this position is, I think, passing down knowledge. I don't want to be an island by myself, you know, and, you know, at some point I'll retire and I want to make sure that the staff is knowledgeable in everything that I know. I'm happy to provide stability. I really am. Um, I think that's important and happy to continue the institutional memory and um, to continue working with the people, you know, the residents and the voters in Amherst. Thank you for tuning into the Amherst Weekly Report from Amherst Media. I'm Claire Healy, and we'll see you at the same time next week.